This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. Today's message is on the power of prayer. The power of prayer. There was once a dry town, and a man purchased a building and was determined to make it into a tavern. And as the tavern was being constructed, a church across the street began to pray against the tavern opening. They prayed through all night vigils. And just as the tavern was about to open, lightning struck it, and it burned to the ground. Well, the tavern owner was not happy about this and sued the church and said it was their prayers that caused the fire. <laughs> they claimed that that was not the case. So as this went to court, the presiding judge said at the beginning, whatever happens with this case, one thing is clear from the beginning. The tavern owner believes in the power of prayer and the Christians do not. <laughs> we pray a lot as Episcopalian Christians. In fact, our document of worship is entitled the book of common prayer we are a people who pray together that is what we are known for and our worship before all else prayer and so the question for us is do we really know the power of those prayers we offer we have before us in luke's gospel the only example where somebody said to jesus teach on something and he did and the topic was the power of prayer. As they saw him praying, which they saw him do a lot, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Let us be like you. And so Luke's gospel, which is written by a physician and focuses on prayer more than any other gospel, really shows us some things about Jesus's prayer life, including the fact that Luke gives seven examples of where Jesus prays where the other gospels don't. Let's look through some of those first, and then we're going to focus on what it means to pray to our Father and what it means to ask for daily bread. And then we'll see how this speaks to us as we journey together as people of prayer. So Luke shows us one instance that the other gospel writers don't, which is as Jesus is baptized, we're told he prays. So what happens in Jesus' baptism? Well, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. We're told that the Spirit came down on him in the form of a dove. And that's where Jesus first is praying with power. The next time Luke shows us his powerful prayer that is unique to this gospel is when he chooses his 12 disciples. What does he do? He's up all night in prayer before making that selection. So already Jesus is showing us the power of prayer in those critical moments of our lives as we're entering the sacraments of the church, like baptism, and when we have big decisions to make. And what a big, weighty decision this would be to select the apostles, the 12. And what was Jesus doing? He was communing with his heavenly father all night long before that decision. Another place Luke shows us Jesus praying is after something big has happened, we're told that Jesus cleanses a leper, which would have been an amazing thing in that time. You were supposed to stay far away from lepers. No, Jesus cleanses him and then goes into prayer. Why? Because Jesus has just poured himself out to the broken and has brought healing and restoration. But now he knows he must go pray. He must be filled up again with the power of the spirit as he goes before his father. As he said, my food, that is my sustenance, is to do the will of the one who sent me. So this is how Jesus is being fed and kept alive spiritually, and it's the same for us. So we've got the baptism, the healing of the leper, the choosing of the apostles. We have another instance where Peter, just before he confesses Jesus as the Messiah, which Jesus says is only revealed by the Spirit, it's not Peter's own humanity that allowed him to know this. What has happened? Jesus has first prayed. He has prayed for Peter, no doubt, just as he prays for us, that we might be awakened to the truth of the Lord. We have Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. What is he doing? Praying, of course. 
He's on a mountaintop. And he's praying, and they see Moses and Elijah mystically appear through the spiritual realm to them. And Jesus is in prayer. He's in conversation with them. We see that Jesus is already reaching the heavenlies as he prays. That's the power of prayer. Luke wants us to see this. We have before us this morning another example. Lord, teach us to pray. They've been watching Jesus pray. They want what he has. Have you seen that in the lives of others where they're so spiritually lit up or at peace, you think, I want that. More than anything else, that's what I really want. And that's what Jesus is offering his followers today as he teaches us how to pray. Well, we have another example. We're coming to the end here where Jesus is on the cross. And what is he doing? He is praying. Praying for the enemies that have put him there. Amazing. How Jesus shows us that prayer must invade our hearts and fill our lives in every way before big decisions, during sacred moments, after we pour ourselves out for the Lord's service, and especially in those times of agony and suffering, we're called to pray. So as we think about the Lord's Prayer, which could be called the Disciples' Prayer, it's our prayer. It's not about me, it's about we. That's one thing we notice. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us. And it begins with our Father. Yes, it's our God as we approach the Lord in a personal way, but at the same time, this is our God, our Father that we share. We are all children of one Father through Jesus Christ as we're adopted into his family by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was very comfortable calling God his Father. This is the one he communed with constantly in the power of the Spirit. He knew he had to be filled up, just as we do. In his full humanity, Jesus grew weary and tired. He bled, he would sweat, he cried, and he prayed in power. In the Old Testament, God was only called Father, we believe, 17 times. It was very rare. People generally, out of respect and awe, kept God at a great distance. Some wouldn't even utter the name out of reference and holy distance. But some did call God Father on occasion. And when Jesus appeared on the scene in the world as the Word made flesh dwelling among us, what did he do? He invited us to call God his Father as our Father. Abba is the word in Aramaic that Jesus would have used, meaning Papa or Daddy or something similar to that. It's an invitation to a very intimate, close relationship with God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sustainer of all that was and is and evermore shall be in the power of his spirit. This is the one that Jesus says, come to him and call him Abba, Daddy. He loves you. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every need that you have. He wants to meet it, and he wants you to cry out to him with prayer and power. In the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus calls God Father 65 times. In John's Gospel, it's over 100. Read through the pages of Scripture. See Jesus' passion and his prayers. He calls his Father down in the Spirit all the time to prepare Jesus for his ministry, but also to prepare the hearts of those that would come to the Lord in faith. And what we know is that Jesus lives to intercede now. Through his glorious ascension, he fills the whole universe with his presence. There's no place that Jesus is not, and what he's always doing is he is praying for you and for me. Constantly, never ceasing. What a gift that is. So just as the disciples saw Jesus physically praying, we now know by faith that in the power of the Spirit, he is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us constantly. Knowing all the battles we face, all the struggles we have, all the compassion that God gives us for the world, he's praying for us all the time. What Jesus shows us is how to pray specifically with the Father, which is we pray to the Father through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, modeling him. Our Father. And God knows our every need. He has good gifts for us. And this takes us to the point about daily bread. Now, some of us had the privilege of going to Egypt a few years ago 
And what we saw from the air as we flew over the Nile Valley was an incredibly lush green area that suddenly, through a very visible line, went from being green vegetation and abundance to a dry, hot desert where nothing could seem to live. And this is where God led the people into the wilderness onto the way to the Promised Land. Forty years they wandered, and it shouldn't have taken that long if you went in a straight line, but there was something going on with them, and that is they were being taught how to pray. And this is where the concept of daily bread comes from. They were fed with manna, that is this mysterious substance which translates, what is it? They were fed with, what is it? Every day. Just enough for today, if they tried to store it up and keep it overnight for the next day, it would spoil. So they were given enough manna for today. And so when Jesus says, as you pray to your father, say, give us this day or today our daily bread, it conjures up the image of God's promises from old as God was feeding God's people with just what they would need. Maybe not what they'd want because they wanted to go back to the leeks and onions of Egypt a lot. And yet they were called to keep walking in faith, to obey and to pray. So Jesus teaches us to ask for our daily bread, that we can trust our Heavenly Father, that he loves us and desires what is best for us and wants us to feed us. Yes, of course, it, revol it revolves around material goods at some level, real food, but it's really about a spiritual reality. The one Jesus referred to when he said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. And so Jesus promises that as we pray in the power of the Spirit, in his name to our Heavenly Father, we'll have what we need for this sacred journey as God teaches us how to pray along the way. Because you are in the wilderness, so am I. As we make our way toward the promised land, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, and we struggle and we weep and we hope and we love and we laugh together all the time. That's what it means to be pilgrims on the way. And what we're learning together as we wander, not always in a straight line, sometimes we go backwards and to the side, but eventually we'll make our way. Right now, what the Lord is doing, just as he did for the Israelites in the wilderness, is teaching us how to rely upon him for strength. And so what we learn as we pray are things like this. If we're praying and asking God for what we need, if what we're asking for is wrong, God will say no. If what we're asking for isn't the right time, God will say, slow. If what we're asking for reveals that there's something not quite right with us yet, God will say, grow. You've experienced this, surely, as you offer up prayers. You wonder if they'll be answered in the way you think they should be. And that's why we always say, thy will be done. Because God might just be saying, no, or not yet, or slow it down. Or, hey, you, grow. Grow through this struggle. But when everything's lined up with God's will, there will be those moments when the Lord says, go. And you know what this is as you come to your Father in prayer, in the power of the Spirit and in Jesus' name. And he'll show you, as he shows us together in common prayer, how this works. We live with this all the time. This is the journey of faith that we share. So it's a pretty sweltering morning already, as we know. And I was looking at a thermometer on the way over here and realized it's gonna be very warm today. And I remembered an illustration I wanna share as a way of wrapping this sermon up. When it comes to the power of prayer, one thing we can look at in our lives to determine where we are with our prayer life is to see, are we a spiritual thermometer or are we a spiritual thermostat? What does a thermometer do? It simply responds or reacts to what's happening externally, right? But a thermostat actually sets the temperature, sets the tone, and has the effect in the environment around it. And we know that sometimes we can be very much like thermometers going up and down based upon what's happening around us. But to be a holy thermostat in prayer is to be centered upon the Lord, to seek our Heavenly Father, to be filled with His Holy Spirit, to know that our advocate Jesus is praying for us all the time and to set 
the spiritual temperature around us as God works through us. That's what it looks like as we journey together in prayer through the wilderness, that we can be those holy thermostats together, changing the world by our centered nature upon the Lord. So as people of prayer, may we know the power that we've been privileged to yield together and to wield together and to live out together as people of one Father who loves us, who has good gifts for us, and who is always calling us home saying, come to me, I'm here. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Amen.